Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to Art Basel Salon. Uh, I'm very pleased to be moderating this talk today, the Arab Spring and its impact on artists. Uh, I'm Adia Sanusi, and I'm joined here by Till Felrath, a celebrated curator, um, and with his partner, Sam Bardewil of Art Reoriented, uh, the, the curators of the opening show for Methef uh, Museum in Doha, Qatar. We have Shadi Habib Allah, an artist who, uh, for the first time this year, is showing at Art Statements with Green Art Gallery just, just in front here. And Mohammed Afkami, a collector uh, of Iranian descent living in Dubai. So I think for us, you know, we just want this to be a, a conversation, really, and to hear your thoughts afterwards also. And, and to really just talk about the Arab Spring and what it means uh, to the artists of, of the countries affected by the Arab Spring, but really, I think, to artists in general. Um, and I think one of our first <coughs> points uh, that we've discussed in the past is, is, you know, has there really been time for artists to, you know, absorb exactly what's happened, to understand, to process, and to then follow through and actually create art, you know, based on the activities of the last year and a half. So I think, uh, you know, for, for Till, maybe we'll, we'll ask him first, you know, his experiences of the show he did in Doha, <clears throat> working with artists from the Middle East, and, you know, that process. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Alia, for the introduction. Um, what I wanted to actually say directly in, uh, in reference to what you said is there has there been enough time for artists to absorb what was happening. I think it's also a little bit problematic when people coin these terms like the Arab Spring, for example. It actually puts an emphasis on a very momentous event, on uh, the toppling of a few dictators in the region. But it is not to say that this is only then that there were problems in a lot of those countries. So artists that actually are working in these countries are talking about those issues that have been building up for many, many uh, decades, if you will. So the fact that now maybe there is a regime change as such does not mean that all of a sudden people start to think about issues that um, are really pertinent to these countries. When we did the show in Doha, Told Untold Retold, for example, it so happened that it just opened really a few weeks before all the revolutions started happening one after the other. But a lot of those works when you see them in there, they were all new commissions, are really such a, a kind of a premonition, if you will, to the events that were to unfold. So I think the question should really not just be so much on the Arab Spring and highlighting something as if it was a fundamental change in the way artists are working in the region. It is maybe just a symbol of an ongoing um, situation that is maybe now going into a different direction, but it is not a new thing, I would say. And for instance, Shadi, I mean, you're, you know, a Palestinian born in Jerusalem, holding an Israeli passport. I mean, clearly that's, you know, wrought with, you know, thought preconceived notions of, of your, you know, politics and politicization. But you, you know, graduated from Columbia with your MFA. You're working in New York. And your work is really just about the idea of, you know, universal ideas about illicit economies, subcultures, and the work you're showing here at our Basel has exactly to do with that. So, I mean, for you, have you seen an impact on your own practice, on your own work, or it's for you, you're just focusing on a universal notion? Um, I think uh, for me now, I mean, it's been also for uh, before that, that I, th I, th I thought it's always good like to get yourself distanced from uh, that kind of context in a way, in order, as I, I was talking to you before about the idea of uh, like the subject matter not becoming like the most important thing in the in the work because uh, then it kind of like redeems itself in some like uh, certain way and uh, the like execution the execution no longer is yeah important. the execution and the, like the practice itself is is no is no longer important so I think even like now it's probably more that I would like keep that distance and like be more of an observer and see how, how that develops mm -hmm. but um, uh, as I said probably that. Um, the idea like also of the Arab Spring, uh, like its impact on artists, we see like all these uh, forms kind of uh, like kind of like very immediate forms such as graffiti emerging and like um, the hip hop kind of like uh, rap Arab music is kind of like taking dominance now. And, and it was it was it was there before, but now in the sense like it's more taking uh, like talking about like it feels like now it's more immediate and relating to the issues of what's happening today. Um, but and For uh, instance, you see a lot of, I think one of the main things we've talked about is that the most obvious uh, pieces of, if you want to call them art, is the graffiti that appears absolutely. on the streets. 
Mm. Um, and I think we've all seen those images. And, and I don't know, you know, a lot of us would want to say that you wouldn't necessarily call graffiti art, you know, art that you would see at a, you know, major galleries. But Jeffrey Deitch, who just spoke right before us, did a major show of graffiti art in Los Angeles last year. So, I mean, for Mo, how do, you know, what are your thoughts of including graffiti art in your own collection? <laughs> I mean, I think that right now what you're seeing on the sort of Arab street is something that is not new. I mean, as Shadi said, you know, you had Leila Shawa in the 90s depicting some of the messages that you saw uh, in Gaza where the graffiti art was not just used as an expression of exactly. what was going on, but also used as messages to avoid sort of Israeli censorship. And going back before that, you have Iran, you know, where we had graffiti art, we had poster art. In fact, I, I thought I'd show a couple slides, yeah. if you don't mind, Please. just on, on some of the images that you could see. Uh, I'm just going to forward this because I want to talk about this in a second. Because, Mo, you've, you've focused your own collection on Iranian art, of course. That's correct. And I thought it would be interesting because we talked about how, what is the effect, per se, on the Arab artists. And it's probably, when you speak to other Arab artists, it's, it's too early to tell. But what you do have, not necessarily a, an exact template, but you have a historical precedent. And that precedent was the Iranian Revolution. And these are some of the images that you see. And like, for example, this image is, is quite powerful. It's, it's a martyr. And you see him, he's kneeling, and then he's falling forward to his death. And the red has two connotations. Obviously, one is his blood. But also, at the time, there was a strong Marxist movement uh, that was opposing the Shah. And again, it's reflected in these sort of colors of red and so forth. And then the example of you know, posters showing a dead martyr. Contrast this from Iran 1979 to Egypt today, where the same sort of depictions are made by martyrs struggling for their freedom. So for me, I find it very interesting that this struggle for freedom is a repetitive situation throughout history, just nonstop repeating itself. And I'm only using the last 30, 40 years, but if you look at any revolution, whether it's Arab, Iranian, French, it's always violent, uh, it's always about freedom, and unfortunately, we're seeing an interesting thing develop, and I hope it doesn't end up being the case as it was in Iran, where sort of a group of unhappy members of society have come together, but then had their cause hijacked by one or two predominant groups. In Iran, it was uh, the Islamic powers that, that sort of united and, and eventually pushed aside the communists, the socialists, the intellectuals, and took power. Some might say the same thing is happening in Egypt, mm. but we'll have to see. I mean, Till, you made the point uh, the other day that uh, you know, your own family you know, were refugees in Europe not so long ago. And so you know, it's not that the exactly. Arab world has the, the, only, the only source of conflict. It just happens to be more recent. Yeah, exactly. So. I mean, uh, Germany, uh, I'm originally from Germany, and there, you know, the, the war was quite devastating, and there were 10 million refugees coming from the eastern territories into, you know, what was left of, of Germany, in a sense. So the point, I think, is not so much to, to compare things, but I think one thing is really quite problematic. Now, when you talk about the Arab world and Arab region, it is really quite interesting that everybody jumps at this and thinks, you know, what does it mean for the artists? Why do Arab artists uh, have to react to something like this? And why does it make a special case, in fact? Why is it such an automatism that an Arab artist has to be an activist or has to do something that is related to the political circumstances? It is, in fact, a question that you can ask yourselves. To, are there any panels on uh, how do Greek artists react to the Euro crisis? Is there a panel? What about Japanese artists? Well, how are they reacting to Fukushima, to the disaster, which paralyzes the entire country and its economy? It's a huge, huge global event and a global shock. Why do we not have a panel on American artists talking on the housing collapse and the, and the bubble of the financial uh, uh, world that burst a few years ago? So I think it is an interesting question that when it comes to the Arab world, it is automatically assumed that this is the case. Now, so I now think we know who the provocateur on the, on the panel is. Yeah, uh, the panel. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think it is an interesting point, in fact, and uh, when you see what it actually does to the artist, I think there is one fun there are two fundamental effects. I think the first fundamental effect that you are seeing, because there is so much media attention on what's going on in the region, including Iran, you see such an outpour of shows 
that are focusing in sort of an ethnic way on the region. There are so many Arab shows, there are so many Iranian shows. But the Mori Museum opened the Arab Express exhibition at the moment. So the documenta has an over proportional representation of Arab artists but in I the mean, show. You know, it's not that we're, we're living in a bubble. I mean, of course, the art, the art world is also reacting to what you see on sure. TV. And I mean, any time I turn on the news, not just because you know, I'm, I'm Arab and I'm Libyan, and I, of mm. course, am focusing on what's happening in Libya, but you see these horrific images coming out of Syria. It's on the front page of every, uh, every magazine. You know, you go sit at a dinner with no Arabs present, but then all they'll do is talk about the Arab Spring and, and what's happening. And I think that, you know, artists are not immune to this also. And so, of course, they're, you know, processing their own thoughts. That is correct. I think what I'm criticizing is not just, not that, but what I'm criticizing is on the one hand, there is this, amazing interest on artists coming from the region. And I think it's much stronger than if you come from uh, any country, say Germany or whatever, or Japan for that matter, where there's a fundamental thing that has happened. But it also means that artists are not given the freedom oftentimes to just be artists. You know, People don't look at them. If I just want to make an amazing painting or an amazing sculpture, and I have really developed this amazing technique to do something with uh, seashells or something, you know, you it is always seen in this context, well, I have to talk about the Arab Spring. But then people have to focus on you know, something that makes it relevant to them. I mean, Mo, your collection, you know, you're Iranian, your collection is, you know, Iranian art and a historical collection of Iranian art. So, I mean, for you, doesn't it, it make sense because it, it has an impact on you and you have no, a, a feeling I, for it. I understand your point, Till, but I think it's not a fair one. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'll tell you why. Yes, Tom. Because the difference between, you know, Japanese artists focusing on the impact of Fukushima or Americans focusing on the bubble crisis. These are momentary instances in their history. I disagree. And they're in open societies. The artists in our region take it upon themselves to reflect what's going on in these otherwise heavily censored and politically you know, neutered societies. So I think it's very important because in a hundred years from now, we might have images from Twitter and Facebook and whatever else. But these bits of art, whether they're posters, oil on canvas, whatever medium these people choose, they will be the chronicles of what happened in that period. Because these are still closed societies. And I think it's very, very important that they express that. And they have to be impacted. I mean, you know, the nuclear crisis in, in Japan was awful. But as I said, it was momentary. We move on. I disagree with you. I mean, the impact of this is so fundamental on the society, the economic shock, the environmental damage, the number of people that died, just but died in this incident. And it is a conservative society that deals with a lot a of taboos also. But there's a in Japan. It is a, there's a there's lot of a societal free... taboos, you know. I think yeah. it's uh, talking about degrees in here. Yeah. And well, I, I think the Middle yeah. East is very closed. And so these artists, they perform a function that would otherwise not be as relevant in other parts of the world, which are more liberal and open. I, I also disagree. I think it's not a good thing to also limit the region again to censorship. You know, I think this is such a focal but point on the discussion. It is it censor, is. but it's I think you have degrees of censorship anywhere in the world. But your, your show are, your yes. in Doha was Arab artists talking. Correct. To, yeah. So. I didn't uh, encounter censorship, for example. No, but show. I'm not talking about or, censorship, or but I'm saying encounter. you did a show focused on Arab artists. Correct. I mean, it was an a, a ethnically themed show. Well, we redefine what it means to be Arab also in the show. So we said never the title Arab is in the title of the show. No, but there it, were artists with roots in the Arab world. You know, we had yeah. specifically worked with artists that were third or second generation, born in France already. They don't even speak Arabic anymore. Yeah. So the notion of what it means and what you, what you do um, depends on also very much the context that you put on a show. Mm -hmm. The Arab Museum of Modern Art has a modernist collection. So the mandate of that show was to actually bridge this into the contemporary and assess what can we learn and what is, is there a lineage or what is actually the connection with the collection in, in present mm -hmm. times? So I think this is a specific mm -hmm. case. And Shadi, you, you mentioned just earlier today about the, the actual, you know, the subject matter, you know, redeeming the work rather than the actual execution or treatment of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you, you think that also the same for, you know, something like this, the idea of identity, you know, whether or not identity is just the, the marker rather than the, what the, the piece of the work is? Yeah, I mean, uh yeah, identity probably like seems the main like concern. I mean, also like the visual references sometimes like it's not probably like the work shouldn't. It's not. It's not more about identity, but like the visual references in the work. And I think like that's also. I mean, for me, it's, it's sometimes I find it as a problem. But it's like 
I, I think like there's some artists who really manage to like navigate that in a very interesting way. But I think like it even makes it hard just probably like it's a safe strategy to stay away from that for the meantime and because uh, I think like dealing with these issues in the in kind of like proper way is 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 not an easy, you know, and it's not an easy like uh, task. Mm. Mm. But uh, yeah, what I was going to say. Uh, Yes, but I think like in terms of the of the Arab Spring, in in, in the sense that uh, yeah, we, we said earlier that like probably it was more interesting what led up to these events, like how how people see that yeah, the it. background, like what preceded all, all these incidents and how people feel about that, artists, writers, etc. And and it, I think like it's more imp important than the impact is like what kind of like there's some kind of. Uh, um, like some kind of uh, reward in the sense of like these people feel that all the work they did, like this kind of sedimentive work, led to this, like had, had part, the had part. As, the protest as the accomplishment, as I think what we discussed yesterday. Yes, yeah. yes, in that sense. Um, yeah, but I mean, it's it's uh, probably like what we would be, what is a bit evident is that uh, like uh, all these. Uh, art practices in, in the Arab world at least probably seemed like to be mediated before uh, through some like radical autonom autonomies like in, in institutions and etc. So they end up like whatever like kind of uh, statements they had to say it always like ends up confined within the white cube. But now it seems like more to be moving uh, towards the public sphere like this it becomes the site. And that's why it, it's, it's kind of like it's, it's mixed at this moment where between because it's, it's the same site where activism takes place, so it's kind of like difficult to differentiate where the activism where, stops yeah. and the performance begins. Yeah, I mean, where, where that like the and boundaries what you between were saying both. About the you know kind of what you saw the similarities between the sh sh was it the Shah Naram and and you know modern day you know Iranian works and actually even modern day Ira you know activism, and that it was the idea of the same imagery appearing again in the act of violence. Yeah, I mean, I've got a I've got a slide up behind, and this I thought was a very interesting slide because. This is from Shirin Nishat's recent show at Barbara Gladstone that was in January this year. If you look, that's an image of a, of a man today in Iran. And on his chest is an image of the Shahnameh, which is you know, one of the most important pieces of Persian literature that was written by a great poet, Ferdowsi. Uh, it was a 60,000 verse work that was produced over 33 years, between 977 and 1010 AD. And here, you'll see on his chest these battle figures. And the story of uh, the Shah Nama, which is um, the Book of Kings, that's what it translates to, is this epic story about, well, the history of Iran uh, from the beginning, literally from the beginning of the world, up to the conquest uh, of Iran by the Arabs and Iran becoming a, a Muslim country. And here, she's trying to resonate that, like, throughout history, we're always having these confrontations, there's always violence, and always in the name of change for the better. But in reality, it just goes round and round in this vicious, repetitive circle. And, you know, Shirin Neshat for me is a very interesting example because she's an Iranian who lives in New York, uh, has recently made a film on Umm Kulthum, which is, you know, one of the most important Arab singers in Cairo, was there in Tahrir to see these images and absorb it. And this is what she told me was personally impacting her. So this is what made me feel that this repeats itself. And she used it in the context of Iran, but again, it, it shows that there is an impact. And it's an impact from a very unusual but very relevant person. Mm. So I thought this was a good example. Again, this is from the same series. You see he's, this man's holding his hand over his, his heart in the form of a pledge. But he's pledging that no matter what, he will move forward until he gets his freedom, if, even though that means that he'll die or result in being a martyr. Same sort of imagery again. I think it's very poignant, and it shows that regardless of what people want to say, the struggle for freedom is a very resonating and very heartfelt uh, feeling for artists, especially artists who are more sensitive than most people. Mm. You know, I don't see the same sensitivity when Americans lose their houses because they have 400 mortgages on different properties. I just don't feel the same sympathy. Yeah. It's different when your life mm -hmm. is at stake. Mm -hmm. So this is an example of the impact. Right. Until you were saying about in Documenta, in a, a work you had seen of Rabin Marouet, 
um, directly discussing Syria, actually. Yeah, but I, this is, I mean, I don't know uh, if, if uh, many of you had the chance to see Documenta already, but uh, there really is a very big presence of artists from the region, in particular Arab artists, um, and a lot of them you can see here on, on show in various galleries. And I think f he's really the only one that actually directly talks about what is going on. You know, he talks, he filmed uh, Syrian protesters as they were filming their, their killers, you know. So these are scenes from handheld devices such as uh, portal, uh, you know, the mobile phones or or things. So as they're looking uh, around and filming some sort of person or some, some sort of protest, and then the camera sees you see a sniper pointing at them, and the next thing you see is that the camera is falling on the floor. So this is, of course, a very powerful uh, reaction to it. Um, so clearly, you can see artists doing that. Um, but there are really so many artists that are not at all doing that. You know? So the, he's actually the exception <clears throat> to the rule. If you want to uh, look at all those Arab artists, in fact, they're all new commissions. And he, I think, is the only one that in, in such a direct way talks about the so-called Arab Spring. And I think it's also important to point out that it's not a uniform region, you know? So in as much as, you know, we were having this discussion yesterday that always people talk about the Western audience and the Western this and the Western that, but there is no Europe, there is no West. I mean, is that Brazil? Well, is it a Christian thing or something? Or what does that mean, you know? They can't even agree on the Euro, so I think there is no, uh, <laughs> no coherence there at all. But the same applies to the Arab world also, you know? I mean, each country is going through a very, very different thing. You know, Lebanon is, uh, you know, always in denial. Um, there's not really a revolution. It's a pretty free society. You know, artists are not censored. You know, they have pretty much all the freedoms that they want to do whatever they want, and so do the galleries. I mean, there is not much censorship of any sorts going on. Uh, just across, uh, you know, you, go, you look at Syria, you know, it's 30 kilometers uh, uh, away from, from Tripoli, just on the other side of the border. The biggest massacres are happening. As we speak so clearly, you know, it's a very different situation. Then you look at the Gulf in Dubai and Qatar, or you look at Saudi Arabia, you know, where women are not allowed to drive, for example. So but then you have an the artist. spectrum is extremely, extremely diverse. But then you diverse. have artists within, within each of those, those societies talking about their own problems. I mean, you just sure. talk about, you know, Saudi. Absolutely. Of Manal Doyen, well, Doyen sure. of you know, edge, uh, you know, having shown her work at Edge of Arabia in Correct. January, directly mm -hmm. discussing being Absolutely. a woman in Saudi Arabia, and I think you know, I know I'm, I'm, you know, the only woman on a panel surrounded by three men, but I think we really <laughs> need to talk about the impact on women of the Arab Spring, and there has you know, been a kind of gross, I think, injustice done. Um, to women, um, you see in Egypt now. You see, you know, also what's happening in Libya, um, and you know, we don't want this to become uh, a revolution against women and against women's rights. Uh, really, at the end of the day, and I think that when you have societies that are kind of slowly, you know, bubbling with this this desire, and you have an artist like Manal in Saudi talking about her own struggles, I think that it's uh, you know something you can't deny. Uh, for each of them, and you, you were saying also in Iran, it be, you know, women were very actively involved, and then, you know. This is interesting. Again, I wanted to draw the comparison to, uh, that things repeat themselves. These are images from Tahrir, where you see women depicted in the original graffiti, which is sort of pharaonic art, and they're climbing a ladder. This is sort of a depiction of uh, the Ramesian temple in Luxor, and I, I think the artist is suggesting that as you know, women climb the ladder, they're also elevating their stature in society. And again, using sort of political imagery, but mixing it with a tradition, gives a sense that women are, are at the forefront of this Arab awakening. And they are, but the problem is, they're probably gonna end up getting the raw end of the deal. Because what's happening in Egypt is your choices, as Tom, uh, you know, Tom Friedman said, you can either vote for a 1952 general, or you can vote for a 699 AD Islamic cleric. That's the result of the change and all the bloodshed. An example is again shown in Iran where this is a poster from 1979 and the woman in white with her fist sort of pushing through is a depiction of Imam Ali's uh, daughter, Zainab, who is also the sister of uh, Imam Hussein. Imam Hussein, just for those of you who are not Muslim in the audience, uh, was was suffered a massive defeat and was massacred in a battle in 680 AD in Karbala, which is a big, it's the most important day in sort of Shia history because uh, here Zainab ended up being taken back to Damascus uh, as the vanquished uh, of 
of uh, so Khalif she became Yazid. a symbol of the revolution. She became a symbol of like the Shias and uniting them and keeping them strong. And it was through this that certain, let's say, pro-Islamic uh, groups in Iran took this as a symbol. And if you see within her body, you see normal uh, Iranian women sort of supporting her. And the idea was, the comparison was this Zainab was trying to defy the Caliph uh, Yazid in Damascus in 680, as Zainab here is trying to defy, Iranian women are trying to defy the Shah of Iran, which is a symbol of the crown that you see is being shattered. So that imagery, again, you know, is being used for political manifestation, and, and that's very relevant in this sort of Arab art context, because whether we like it or not, it's very political. And these images are used again and again, as you can see from here, and, I, and, and I think it's, you know, obviously like a, you know, every artist's choice. And I think, you know, Shad, you were saying that you, for you, you, it's important that you don't make it the most important thing for your work, uh, that your work is about something different. But of course, it's always going to be about your, your own experiences yeah, and your I mean, own I mean, life. It, re it relates on the bigger context, but I found like these issues probably like relate to me or where I come from, but like it's on bigger issues that kind of like have to be dealt with in a way. Right. Yeah, I mean, so. the idea of illicit economies is very relevant. I mean, yeah, of course, also <laughs> like in Palestine, from. there's a lot of this like idea of illicit economies, you know, it's like part of, part of like, uh, it's a, like a major kind of uh, circulation where you have like all these kind of st stolen goods or kind of, uh, how you say, the... Black market. Black market, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's evident part, but like once, once you're there, you always like kind of uh, get consumed into it and you, for you forget like it's part of the everyday, so it, it doesn't become like very apparent. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah, so... Mm -hmm things that are part of everyday life, really. Mm -hmm. well, I think this but, is also a great example, Shadi. I think your piece, because at the end of the day, and I think this is the key thing if, if you know, for anyone, any curator, any collector, any, any dealer, to really understand an artist's work, it is extremely dangerous, I think, and can be very misleading to look at it through the lens of, for example, the Arab Spring, or to look at political um, things that happen, or through the lens of calligraphy, for that matter. These kind of labels, and I think it's very problematic. At the end of the day, I think you're a great example example uh, and your work that you cannot understand your work if you don't understand the person behind it at the end of the day every artist you know if you call them all Arab artists it's simply not accurate every <clears throat> it's a pretty basic thing every human being is very different so is every artist you know they have different aspirations different connections you know they may have lost a parent they may have lost a job they may have migrated you know they may have relatives to live all over the world they may be young they may be old they may be poets they may be men they may be women and just picking one of those labels to really force it on an artist and understanding an artist's works is very misleading at best and probably often very detrimental to really even the artists that are working in this region. Well, on that note, thank you. Uh, and I think we'll open up uh, to questions from the audience if anyone has anything to ask or uh, ask us to discuss, I suppose. There's a microphone, I think, going around. Oh. Yeah. What? No question. There's a question here at the front. About the topic, like about the idea of like what you said, like the research and about the uh, I start to explore some way the Arabic art in some different places at Sharhavi and Ali and some art Dubai, things like that. So I don't have enough information. But I would like to know if in this type of political, artistic reaction, strong reaction, uh, some people that, like the government or some authorities, have different reactions or not in front of a work, political work made by a woman and another one made by a man. It's strong reactions, ignorant, ignorant, strong reactions, uh, and any difference between an um, art made by a woman or a man, if it's political and it's strong. I wouldn't necessarily, necessarily say a different reaction whether or not the work is made by a woman or a man, but I definitely think that works that deal with anything sexual or, you know, that have, you know, kind of a direct, uh, a direct discussion of, you know, female issues, be that, you know, female genital mutilation or, you know, just women's rights, I think, and, sec and sexual, you know, sexual issues, uh, those works are, have strong reactions from censors or from governments. But I don't think it really makes a difference whether or not a, the artist itself, um, the artist themselves uh, is a woman or a man, but. Yeah, I, mean, I, th I think 
it's really what the subject of the work is that's going to be either approved or disapproved. Not, I think so too. not the gender of the artist. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. We, I think we have another question. The gentleman there in the back. The topic of today was the impact of Arab Spring on the artist. Uh, is there any uh, sort of assessment about this impact on the international field of the artist, like artists outside of the Middle East? Is there any? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. I was um, last night talking to Harry Blaine, who founded um, Haunch of Venison. And he was telling me that he has an artist, for example, called Pietro Rufo. I haven't seen the work, so forgive me for not providing more detail. But apparently, he's done a recent body of work where he's incorporated you know, poetic calligraphy from the region. And he said it's 100% an inspiration from what he's seen over the last year and a half on the TV screens, you know, depicting this sort of plight of what's going on across the region. So I think there are artists that are being, you know, that are genuinely being impacted. In fact, uh, just on that, uh, you might know this, uh, Ramin, there's, um, there's a show actually coming out in two weeks in Iran, in Etimad Gallery, which is entitled The Arab Spring. Unfortunately, I don't know if Claudio can put the slide up again. Uh, there's an image which you can see, which is an example. I'm sorry, but I've got to show it to you. I've been dying to get it on the screen. Uh, it's an image of a golden gun. And you'll recognize, if you look closely, those are works that look very much like Parviz Tanavoli's early sculpture work, which is a symbol of traditional Iranian art that had only a linkage to traditional motif, Shia folklore, Sufism. But it's in the shape of a gun, which highlights the traditional aspect of art from the region with a gun impacting that it's all up in the air. It's like radical change, violence. That's political art today in the Middle East. So I thought that's, that's a very, very good mix of the impact on what was traditional art. Another question? I think we have another question here. Excuse me. <laughs> oh. okay. uh, sorry, I think. So it's OK. Um, obviously, in Western revolutions, like, um, there have been iconic works of art, like Guernica or Death of Marat or um, Fifth of May, that have become sort of symbols of, of revolutions. And I have two questions. One is, is there, I agree with you that all of the countries involved in, um, in the Arab Spring are idiosyncratic, but are there two or three artists that you people would point to in terms of um, being the most seminal at the moment in being able to comment and transcend and promote uh, dialogue about what's going on now. And the second part of the question is, many people don't think while one is living through something like this that they can make um, a good assessment of it. How long do you think their need, time needs to go by before people can actually look at what's going on in total and, and comment. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, what you said is absolutely true. I mean, a lot of, uh, it, it very much depends again what country you're talking about. You know, if you talk, if you go to Cairo these days, you know, there, it's a country in transition. You know, you really don't know where this is going to go. Uh, you have to wait maybe until the new presidency takes in. You have to let one cycle go by. Hopefully there will be another election that you know it goes the sort of legal cause, and you have to really see what happens to it. You know nobody really can tell where this is going to go. The second thing is that a lot of those artists were really in the streets demonstrating for for many many months and months and months. Also a lot of Egyptian artists they are very closely so there is a different kind of impact. I think we haven't talked about is that uh, that is one of par paralysis uh, uh, so to speak. You know even uh, international artists like Rada Amer is very involved. Her family is in Cairo, but she's been living in New York for. 15 years or so, she really couldn't do any work. You know, she was on Facebook communicating with her friends, observing every last detail. Yeah. So they were really just paralyzed. You know, but meanwhile, people that were, for example, in Morocco or Lebanon, you know, you, there is sort of maybe a connection. Of course, you follow the news, but it doesn't probably quite affect you in exactly the same way. So I think trying to find out an artist that is maybe speaking for across the region is not possible. But I also think in each country, I really think you cannot really say, say that yet. You know, I think there's also uh, something else about art history, art historians, critics, curators. 
to take some time maybe to sort through what's happening and not just galleries and auction houses in a certain sense. So I think it will take time. Ganica was not created an iconic uh, piece, uh, you know, six months after it was created either, you know. It took maybe a few decades to really take its symbol and shows where it was contextualized until it actually, um, you know, became so iconic the way and it has been. And I been. think if you see, for instance, the word of, uh, you know, the work of Walid Rad, who you know, has now a kind of celebrated performance, a documenta, and, you know, kind of fantastic. Amazing performance. Uh, yeah, and a, and a fantastic work here in Art Unlimited, which is actually dealing with 9-11. Um, but many of his series also deal directly with the Civil War in Lebanon um, and his own you know, feelings related to it um, and the impact that it had on Lebanese society. So I think that any one of these artists will have you know, some part of it you know, either be sublimated or just you know, somehow directly impacting them and their families. And I think that you, know, you just have to see within each country who those artists will be. Just following on on what Ali and Till said, you asked for two specific artists. One that comes to mind that I think uh, you should watch closely for is Huda Lutfi. Because Huda Lutfi was doing art that was already very political in nature long before uh, the events of 2011. And interestingly, she was so active in Tahrir every day that for about a year she put her paintbrush down and only now is producing some work. So I would watch for her. She's actually speaking, um, I think, I believe it's on Saturday, right? On Saturday, yeah. yeah. Yeah, she'll be here on Saturday, actually. You can meet her, but that's an artist to watch for. I, I wouldn't single artist out, really. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm I just beg to differ, because, you know. No, I, I see why, no, because I like the fact that, you know, she's not jumping on the Arab Spring bandwagon. She was portraying her but work. But no, neither is Wal Shari, neither is Lala Baladi. I mean, it's Lil Hassan Khan. A lot of artists are, are not doing the same thing. Very prominent Egyptian artists, you know, mm -hmm. that... Well, I understand that, but so I was asked about one, to name okay. one or two okay. artists. So Your opinion. Okay. Question. <laughs> Next question. Yeah, here. Do you have... One, okay. Yeah. Yeah. My name is Mojgan Enjavi Barbe. I'm based in Geneva. I'm a curator with Iranian contemporary artists, and I'm a woman. So it's interesting. <laughs> I heard about all of what you said. I agree with our German curator a lot. If you want to hear about a more scientific and non-ghetto based arts, so go to Documenta. But can I add to what you said and say, you know, because being from Iran, no matter what you do, you're political. I, ha I curated a show in Geneva in April, and the name of the exhibition was Survival. I had three radio interviews, and they were absolutely trying to politicize it. Of course. And I keep saying, listen, it's not a good thing. I'm, we're Iranian. For the past 30 years, 30 years since the revolution, we've been trying to excuse ourselves and justify being Iranians. So why not use this? a marketing tool of sensation like Sachi did with the artist. What's wrong with it? Mm. Okay. So one more a question, maybe? I think. What about Mohammed Bouazizi? No one has mentioned him. And as a Western artist, his act of setting himself on fire was the most incredible moment that I have experienced as a human being that he did that. And it actually inspired a lot of work in my studio based on that event. No. I mean, I think, none of us can, I think none of us can deny you know, his importance. I mean, I, I'm Libyan, and I had never been to Libya before, you know, before the revolution. And I only went back because of the revolution. And so I must thank him and you know, anyone who, who you know, fought and, and died and risked their lives uh, for that act of freedom in Libya. So he, of course, is to me a hero. And uh, I don't believe in the use of the word hero you know, the way it is used so often these days. And he really is one. So I don't think any of us can deny that. I mean, you know, his, his, his act of you know, self-sacrifice um, has impacted many, many people. So. Uh, you know, it's, as a, as a yeah. curator, have you seen other artists deal with that particular person and event as a source for artwork? I think it's hard to really pinpoint it to, you know, I, I really think it's not so much about trying to find works that deal with things in such a literal way. I think at the end of the day, what I was trying to say in the beginning, that actually all those problems in societies and all those tensions, you know, maybe they're culminated in these 
turning points, and they are very powerful turning points. But I think a lot of those issues, they have been talked about by many, many artists in the region for many, many years prior to that as well. So I can't think of one that specifically you know, did a video thing or reenacted it or painted it or, or of Well, sorts, that would be but, too literal. Yeah, but, so, you know, but, but uh, that the issues that led to that, I mean, there is you just, you know, plenty, 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 for sure. I think uh, we have to wrap up. We'll be here for another few minutes if anybody would like to come speak to any of us. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks.